In multivariable calculus, it is important to prioritize understanding over memoriza memorization. This is especially the case for vector geometry and parameterization. Um, I want you to be able to confidently say these sorts of sentences about yourself and your math skills regarding what we've discussed so far. I can draw a relevant picture for the given data of a plane. I mean, instead of just trying to memorize a recipe for creating the equation of a plane, you should be drawing a picture and use the little pieces and build things up in meaningful ways. I can set equal to zero the dot product of two vectors which I learn are perpendicular. That's actually one of the key parts of creating the equation of a plane. And I can write lines and line segments, circles and ellipses in parametric form. In fact, in words, without any computation, you ought to just think to yourself, what is the difference between these two parameterizations here? The first one's x equals 5 plus 2t, y equals 9 plus 3t, and the second is x equals 5 plus 2 cosine t, y equals 9 plus 3 sine t. Notice how similar these are, right? There's just the insertion of a cosine and a sine in the second parameterization. And the first one is a line, right? And in fact, it's a line with slope 3 halves going through the 0.59. Now, how did I get the slope is 3 halves so quick? Um, there's lots of ways to do it, and you can do a lot of work. But I think the easiest approach to this is say, look, whatever moment of time you're at, t is some number. Let's say you look at t equals, it uh, doesn't matter, but then one time unit later, when t is 1 greater, then if t is just bigger by one full unit, then the y coordinate should grow by 3, and the x-coordinate should grow by 2. So in one hour, let's say, that what happens is the change in y, the, the rise is 3 and the run is 2, and so that's where the slope 3 halves comes from. Um, the second parameterization, um, I hope you're starting to see how you would sort of, as a base, start with a circle and then do some stretches and then shift by 9 and shift by 5. And so you should have an ellipse where the uh, horizontal semi-minor axis is 2, which means the overall width of the ellipse will be 4. And the vertical semi-major axis is 3, which just means that eventually, once drawn properly, the overall height of the ellipse should be 6. Okay, so we have, for now, um, we've been looking at parameterizations ju that just have one parameter called t. Like one thing that stands for time. Um, later on, we are actually going to see in the final chapter of multivariable calculus parameterizations that involve two parameters. Say they're called t and u, the two parameters. And what we're seeing now with parameterization is just a warm up to something much more important that we have to have a complete handle on in order to do anything meaningful in chapter 16, essentially. So, so Try not to treat parameterization as something to just memorize. Try to really dig into what it really means. This is going to be super important. And if you really feel like it, just for fun, you could think about what kind of shapes could you create if you had access to two parameters. That might be fun to just think about. Um, just one thing in terms of notation to try to form some good habits. Please note that the label for a real number should be a plain letter like this X right here. Uh, whereas for a vector, the label should look different, like an X with an arrow above it, or a bold X is what the book would prefer. The notation is going to help us avoid confusion, right? We should keep track of a vector being different from a scalar, and by scalar I mean just a plain old number like 5. Um, this notation convention is actually also going to apply in the thing that we're now about to introduce, a thing that happens to be called a vector function. So just to relate it to the past, throughout algebra and in calc 1 and calc 2, a function, let's label it f, was a rule which takes in a real number, let's call it x, as the input and produces a real number's output, which we symbolically say is f of x. For example, if f of x equals x squared, then f of 3 is equal to 9. I mean, you know what I'm about to say here, but I'm just saying it so that we can relate it to some new things. Here, when the input is 3, the output is 9, right? So input's the real number 3, the output then would be the real number 9. Both 3 and 9 are real numbers, and you know about the vertical line test that um, each input can only have one output. Um, in fact, in a class on proofs, this uh, matter about the vertical line test is, is actually part of the definition of a function. Now, can one output correspond to multiple inputs? Sure, that's possible. Even with the function above, f of negative 3 is equal to 9 also, right? So both 3 and negative 3, both of those inputs lead to 9 being the output. But the point is you only get one output, right? So 3 leads to only one output, namely 9. Negative 3 leads to only one output, namely 9. 
Now, the new thing um, is called a vector function. So a vector function, and its label will be R with an arrow above it, just like earlier, a uh, function from algebra is an F with no arrow above it. Also called a vector valued function um, is a rule. So just like over here, F was a rule, uh, which takes a real number's input. That part's the same, real number as input, and produces a vector as output. That is the key difference. Earlier, your previous kinds of functions typically had just a real number's output. Now the output is a vector. So here's an example. R with an arrow above it of t equals, and then this looks like a vector, right? So angle bracket 5 plus 2 cosine of t, comma, 9 plus 3 sine of t, close angle bracket. And you could write this more in the book's fashion by replacing the R with an arrow above instead with a bold R. So there's our first example of a vector function. Let's work with this and do something. So for this vector function, uh, r of t equals 5 plus 2 cosine of t, comma, 9 plus 3 sine of t. What is r of pi? So we're going to use pi as the input. We're going to plug in uh, pi for the t. And so this, while this is new, I hope this does not look too surprising in terms of things that you would have what you would have expected to do had this been some other class like just uh, I'm appealing to your algebra based notation type way of thinking about things but r of pi just replace all the t's with pi's and then let's take a look here well um, cosine of pi would simplify to negative one and so you really have here five minus two simplifies to three uh, then nine plus three sine of pi well uh, sine of pi is equal to zero so you're just left with nine right nine plus zero is nine so you end up uh, when the input is pi the output is the vector three nine your interactive question is to answer this find another input t which also has the output being the vector 3, 9, using the same vector function. Now, given the vector function r of t equals 5 plus 2t, comma 9 plus 3t, comma 1 minus 4t, let's pause. The one difference now, we get a vector, but this is a 3D vector. OK, this is still a vector function. Uh, find r of 0, and find r of 1 half, and find r of 1. So just this is a matter of plugging in t equals zero for the first question, plugging in t is a half for the second part, and plugging in t is one for the third part. I just didn't bother showing all the arithmetic. I hope it is correct here. I hope I don't have errors. Um, you can think about what, uh, I guess, graph you might get, but I think we're going to talk about that in the next little section.